planning for Armenia. And therefore, our activities are only for Armenia to advance science, education, healthcare, technology, and various other areas. Our board members and other members are all experts in various fields, and we try to provide advice, guidance, and research for our, the government of Armenia or the public sector in Armenia. We are currently having working on several different projects. The most important being we have established a new clean room, a class 1000 clean room in the Alihania National Lab for very sensitive scientific research and it's already operational. We're still, of course, um, equipment and uh, different devices are being sent to the clean room to establish a very modern and uh, fully equipped clean room. That is in process already, but we still, we have a few already inside and that is functional. Now, we also have an annual invention competition for young scientists in Armenia for the 15th year. Uh, we receive inventions in various areas and we send it to experts. Experts evaluate the inventions and we decide on a first prize, which, which is $5,000. And then we try to help the invention to become a product if possible, and if the inventors would like to do it, to pursue it further. We also work with the government of Armenia, various institutes in the Academy of Sciences, like the Molecular Biology Institute, the Physical Research Institute, Chemical Physics Institute, and many others, where we provide both instrumentation, as well as advice and guidance in their project. We also uh, have now recently uh, started two new projects. One of them is a research project with the university, with the Yerevan State University, where five uh, scientists are working on a research uh, topic, which is called confined light. Essentially, when you confine light to a nano scale, the characteristic become totally different. And so they are trying to research that, that situation and analyze them and explain what happens to light under confined conditions. Now, uh, we, we also uh, have another program at the Alihanyan National Lab where they are going to research on silicon uh, chip with a new approach. This, the current silicon chips have a few layers and they, their efficiency is very low, a maximum of 20%. This new approach is supposed to raise that efficiency up to 45%. And this research and also the practical uh, experimentation part is being led by the distinguished professor, Dr. Ara Apkarian from the UC Irvine, uh, University of Irvine, California uh, professor. So, and also of course the experimental part is being um, supported by an expert in green room or in, in actually manufacturing of chip, uh, Dr. Aram Tanyalian. So these are essentially the activities that um, we, we work on. And also, of course, we work with the government of Armenia, especially the Minister of Education, Science, Culture and Sports to expand and use, um, we work with the ministry to um, have all the our schools in Armenia to participate in science fairs. And uh, so far, this is the third year that the government has already adopted the program and they are organizing science fairs every year and they are sending their winners 
to the International Science and Engineering Fair, which is held every year in the United States. And ARPA was the, uh, the organization that initiated this process. This is to help students think innovatively and be able to create projects, innovative projects, and solve the problem themselves and be able to report on it, be able to write the report, and be able to actually answer questions about their project. So this is the, uh, the way we, we work in Armenia. And of course, if anybody is interested and if they can help us do more, uh, their work, everybody's welcome to join. We, we need more experts and we need, there's a lot of work to do in Armenia. And now back to our panel discussion. Uh, first, I would like to introduce the moderator for today, Dr. Naida Hoagimian. She has a master's degree in applied mathematics from the Yerevan State University. And she has a PhD in physics and mathematics from the Institute of Applied Mathematics of Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. She's now a W. Grafton and Lillian B. Wilkins Professor of Mechanic Mechanical Science and Engineering at the, and the Director of Aviate Center of University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She has co-authored two books, 11 patents and more than 450 referred publications. She has received so many different awards and so many different prizes that uh, I'm not going to mention, but uh, she's a very active uh, professor. She actually should be a distinguished professor. She's better than many distinguished professors I know. And so I hope she will be in a, in a short while. Um, she, her work has actually been featured on the New York Times, on Fox TV and CNBC. Her research interests are in control and optimization, autonomous systems, machine learning, neural networks, game theory, and applications in aerospace, robotics, mechanical, agriculture, electrical, petroleum, and many other engineering. So she's widely spread actually, and she does a lot of work. And she's a fellow of AIAA and IEEE and many other organizations. So Nairia, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to join our distinguished panelists of today and I will start introducing them. So Alice De Raid works on European research and innovation policy. He follows how innovation changes human life and the planet. Alas, there ensures that public policy fosters the transition of business, research, and education, energy, mobility, and other systems towards more sustainable practices that hopefully help restore the Earth's natural ecosystem on which we and future generations depend. Nara, you had just switched off your microphone. Why did I get muted? I don't know. Yeah, it happens sometimes. My apologies, I'll continue. So Dr. Raid has worked for and with all sorts of people at the European Commission, at OECD, the World Bank, UNECE, and national and regional government and agencies. Uh, Dr. Raid believes while a good strategy or policy is important, the real challenge is how to implement it. Dr. Gora Melin is Deputy Director at the Technopolis Group. He has 25 years of experience of research management policy and evaluations in higher education. He holds PhD and has extensive experience in international evaluations and investigations. Among his recent works, evaluations of studies targeting researcher mobility, international student exchange periods, multidisciplinary research reorganization of universities, academic careers, and international academic cooperation are especially noteworthy. These examples cover many countries in Europe and occasionally beyond. Aram Pakchanyan is the chairman of the board of trustees of IPE Foundation. He was the principal of the IPE school in Armenia and is the vice president of the Abbey Corporation. 
Fakhtanian is involved in educational reform projects and initiatives such as establishment of innovative learning environments, modern educational curriculum, and uh, framework for professional teacher development programs. These are part of the design of the Aradian Baccalaureate, an educational platform intended for Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. His early career focused on space exploration. During the last decade, he has been specializing in mobile autonomous systems. He was recognized with Armenia's Presidential Award for a discovery in theoretical physics. He's an active member of the Gituj Initiative. So, Ali, there, or uh, Goran, do you want to get started with your slide? You said you have some slides. You wanted to do the opening. Yeah, Maybe... thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, we were last in, in, in Yerevan, uh, Goran and myself, plus the, the rest of the team in 2020. So, the what I'll, I'll, see, I'll speak to you now is, is, um, is from 2020, so pre-COVID and, and three other events that we'd rather not have. Um, so, uh, and of course, the situation in Armenia, policy development and economy, uh, innovation, uh, society has moved on probably, but uh, we were uh, asked to do in 2020 uh, support uh, through the European Commission, so under the previous uh, research and innovation framework program called Horizon 2020. Uh, there is a, an instrument called the Policy Support Facility, which uh, allows uh, member states of the European Union, but also associated countries like Armenia, uh, to request support for uh, policy making related to research and innovation in the broader sense of the word. So it can touch on on very specific issues or on on the overall performance of the of the system in each country. Um, so, yeah, what I, I will try and say a few words about uh, is just to give you an idea, a flavor. The report on the front, cover, the front slide there is available. I'll, I'll put it into the chat if you haven't seen this report. It's available online on the Commission's website. Um, so, we were asked by the team, there was uh, the team I will put at the end so you can see who everyone who was involved. We were asked as a team to look at um, three topics, which you can see on the screen here. Um, so we had uh, the development of a model for uh, evaluation and assessment of public research institutions, uh, again defined both in sen the sense of the National Academies, research institutes, uh, other public research institutes attached to ministries, for instance, uh, and also uh, in terms of the higher education uh, research institutes within uh, the public universities. We were also asked to look at how to um, improve the system of funding for research uh, and uh, innovation more generally as well uh, in Armenia, uh, particularly trying to at least introduce some elements of performance-based funding. Uh, your, your Goran is the expert on that, so you may want to say a few words uh, during his, his introduction as well. Uh, and thirdly, to look at measures that could try and bridge uh, a perceived gap between the higher education uh, institutions, universities, and, and, and so on, uh, and uh, the research uh, institutes, and then more generally, of course, uh, economy uh, and society. So um, we, we looked at, first of all, I would say it's important to think what are the elements of uh, a science system or a research innovation system uh, that are required in any country, whether it's Armenia, Belgium, where I'm sitting, uh, or any other uh, country around the world. Uh, you, in our view, and this is set out in the report, you need uh, four key elements. Uh, a good governance of the system, which uh, is not uh, the same as having a, a Ministry of Education and Research or a Ministry of Higher Technology or, or, or Economy and, and, and Innovation, whatever ministries each country decides to have. Uh, it's much broader. It's about having uh, a system which uh, um, has capacity to make policy, make strategies, uh, develop those strategies, and as uh, Naira mentioned in my, my short introduction, implement the strategies. So it's nice to uh, design a strategy, but uh, implementing, implementing uh, government strategies uh, is, of course, what's actually needed. You need a shared vision of the science or research and innovation system. We use the word science here, but uh, you can look at it more, again more broadly. Um, and that vision, again, is trying to understand it's not only about people working in research institutes, it's about the users uh, of science, it's about uh, government, industry, 
civil society users who might be interested in some of the results, uh, and so on. So people have to understand what the science system is supposed to be contributing to. Uh, and uh, this was something which we, we found was still not necessarily uh, optimal uh, in Armenia, the understanding of the, the importance of a science system and how it can contribute to uh, Armenian development. Third, money. Uh, money is always important. Uh, it's not the, the only, um, the only uh, important thing, of course. You need uh, skilled people uh, and so on, but uh, they, they usually come through, through funding, whether it's public or private or a mix. Um, and uh, we'll see a bit more on that. And of course, the forms of funding. So I said, one of the things we were asked to do was not only look at how the basic uh, funding comes to research institutes or universities, but to look at models that uh, incentivize uh, performance of the researchers, uh, both in terms of scientific research, but also in terms of uh, other types of impact that can be foreseen from the research activities. And then, of course, the organizational research activities, which uh, there are many uh, models around uh, Europe and, and beyond, uh, which can be built, uh, drawn on, but to try and understand how do we structure our research system uh, do we have, uh, you know, one or two very large institutes, or do we try and have uh, a set of diversified ones? How do we co uh, cooperate within uh, those, those uh, activities, uh, both within the research system, but also with uh, other actors like government or, or industry or, or civil society, as I mentioned previously? Um, there were three key messages that came out of our, our, our study. Uh, they're probably not a huge surprise to anyone who's working in the Armenian system. Um, and they're sort of preconditions in some ways. Um, so the first one was R&D funding uh, from the government uh, needs to be increased. And of course, that's easy for uh, experts from Brussels and Sweden and so on to, to say, uh, and probably harder for uh, Armenian uh, government with, with budgetary constraints and so on to do. But if you take Armenia and you look at Armenian investment in R&D uh, funding uh, from the public sector, from the government sector, and you compare it to uh, other uh, countries in the region or other middle uh, to, to high income countries, uh, clearly the level of funding is below what is required to sustain the system and particularly to retain the qualified young researchers. And I think we were uh, as a panel, as a team, we, we met many people during our, our missions to Armenia um, and, and lots of young people as well as, as more, more senior people. Uh, and I think we were impressed by the, the enthusiasm and the motivation of many people in the system, but they're facing quite, quite difficult situations with um, access to funding to uh, do the research and to uh, uh, also then translate that research into results that can be used in the economy or society. We were also concerned that any sort of overly rapid restructuring of higher education and research institutes should be avoided. And why did we say that? Because we were able to observe some relatively strong uh, and well-functioning research institutes, some under the National Academy uh, structures, some on, under uh, other, other forms of public research institutes. Uh, while we saw that within the university sector, the, the research strategies were still uh, being were evolving. And in many cases, the universities, there are many universities, possibly probably too many, that was one of our conclusions as well in Armenia. Uh, so there's a need for restructuring, there's a need for consolidation, but this shouldn't be done uh, overnight uh, with a sort of magic wand that doesn't work like that. And uh, experience from other countries, uh, which we cited in the report, uh, underlines that. So we were concerned that there's a need for restructuring, but it shouldn't be done in a way that actually undermines the existing uh, strong research capacities in some of the institutes uh, in Armenia. Um, and then in evaluating research institutes, and again, I'm using that word in a, in a broad way, so it can be either research institutes under the National Academy, it can be research institutes under specific ministries or within uh, universities. Um, when we're evaluating their performance and trying to assess them, which is again common practice uh, across across the developed world, uh, the, the OECD countries, um, then and looking at how we allocate future funding, uh, we need to strike a balance. We need to strike the balance between research that has high international impact, 
uh, which is obviously uh, desirable. And research that is also locally relevant and contributes to uh, national social and economic development objectives and other objectives such as uh, security or, or, or uh, environment, for instance. So we, we set these sort of three key policy messages as a sort of uh, introduction uh, to our overall recommendations. We then made 19 recommendations in, in, in four main categories. Again, I won't I don't have the time and I, I spend the whole time just going through them all individually, so I won't, uh, but you can read them in the report. Um, so we had 19 recommendations in the four main categories. So we had four recommendations which were linked to these necessary conditions for a successful reform. We had six about uh, putting in place an evaluation of research capabilities and performance within the research system. Uh, six related to uh, the higher education and research cooperation. So trying to bring a stronger cooperation between the higher education where you're trying to train uh, masters and, and doctoral students, for instance, uh, and, and, and they need training within the research institutes often in order to do their, their, their education uh, and, their, and their doctoral research. Uh, so you need those links uh, between the two systems much stronger than they are, they, they are at the current time. So we made six recommendations there. And then three recommendations about shifting uh, over time gradually to more performance-based funding uh, of research uh, within the system. The necessary conditions then, so we recommended, and again, this was quite a strong recommendation, uh, and we, we appreciated that, it, again, it can't be done overnight, it takes uh, time. Uh, but we felt that the current higher education institute HEI sector uh, is too fragmented. Uh, this is, a, I think, a general problem in the Armenian system, both within the edu higher education and the research system. There's simply too many institutes, too many centers, too many uh, inst institutions. Um, so we, we felt there's a, a need to consolidate those uh, existing capacities into a limited number uh, of research-based universities. Of course, there can be other additional universities or higher education institutes that are more teaching universities, but uh, you know, if you're trying to, within the scale of the country of Armenia, uh, concentrate resources and have uh, the quality you, you, you aspire to as a country, uh, then that's probably a sort of maximum number. Um, we also looked at, made recommendations for the governance structures for research and innovation policy. Uh, we felt that they're still needing more consolidation. I think here in Brussels, uh, well, across the European Union, but uh, in Brussels, we, we tend to talk about increasingly about the whole of government approach. So the need to have cooperation across ministries and not have uh, an, an education ministry, ministry that's doing one thing and uh, a ministry of high technology or research uh, and innovation that's doing something else. You need that cooperation and increasingly also with other ministries such as agriculture, mobility or transport, uh, environment, and so on. Uh, you, you need to have that cross-government approach, and, and that needs to be reflected in the way policy is designed and implemented. Uh, we, we felt that, you know, again, looking at how national academies of science have evolved uh, in most countries, uh, particularly within Europe, but in particular within Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the countries that joined the European Union over the last uh, decade or so, decades or so, uh, we've seen a, a move from the National Academies of Science as single research, as sort of coordinating all research institutes towards more a learned society. Again, we're not saying, we weren't saying for Armenia, you know, the National Academy of Science shouldn't have any research institutes, we're saying it should have a, a new role that might be a bit more perspective, might be a bit more trying to steer uh, the science system, the research and innovation system, uh, and provide input, uh, strategic input, for instance, around things like uh, foresight or, or technology uh, needs of the country. And then, yeah, the fourth, which is like obviously linked to our previous uh, slides, uh, there's a, a need to increase government expenditure on R&D uh, over uh, the period. We, we were writing 2020, so we talked about uh, 2025 as a target and we, we made recommendations in the report. Implementing an evaluation of research capabilities. So there, there is, work being done. The National Academy of Science has uh, work going on. We felt that is a was a basis at that time for a much stronger evaluation of research capacities and, and, uh, and uh, performance within Armenia uh, to orientate and focus research on uh, the research researchers, research teams that have the required 
uh, capacities and skills and management uh, uh, profiles that can actually deliver high quality research. Um, we, we put together a set of criteria, uh, which we felt were relevant, uh, that also highlighted uh, elements of how Armenian research activities could contribute to, uh, the, the, again, the economy, environment, uh, security of the country and so on, and not only uh, on standard research outputs with people like academics like your publications or sometimes patents, but uh, they're nice, uh, but it's, it's not enough. We wanted to try and see more translation uh, into uh, the, 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 the economy of society. This obviously requires reform to the, the government structure. So the, 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 the science committee uh, structure and the high level uh, steering committee we, we recommended. And we also recommended to put in place an international technical assistance support with panels per field of science uh, drawn, for instance, from the diaspora, which we uh, know is very strong and, and very supportive uh, of Armenia and obviously linked to the additional uh, budgetary support that we mentioned. Boosting higher education and research cooperation. So we made a number of recommendations there as well. Um, there had been previous work, which I was also involved in under the EU SMEDA, which is SME, Small and Medium Sized Enterprise uh, Program, uh, which proposed an innovation strategy. That was quite a long time ago, it was 2018, but we felt some of those elements were still very relevant uh, and should be taken on board. Um, we felt there's a need for a national research infrastructure roadmap. That's again something which is absolutely standard uh, in all European countries uh, and indeed uh, non-European countries uh, to try and structure the investment that goes into research infrastructure across the system over a five or to seven or ten year period it depends on the country we were aware that there's a lot of research equipment and data already in Armenia some of that is still quite close so we recommended having a system that would be much more open access so if Professor X or Y has a nice piece of shiny equipment that's been paid for uh, through uh, government funds or, or other donors. Uh, that, that equipment should be available to other researchers in the system, obviously on uh, a basis of uh, good management of that equipment and, and access policies. We felt there was a need to have inter-university doctoral schools. So again, this idea of gradual shift over time. So to try and have a number of pilot initiatives to have doctoral schools on different topics that would bring together researchers, doctoral researchers from uh, different universities that we could work together and be trained together. Again, this idea of pooling uh, the resources within what is a relatively small system uh, to try and optimize both use of equipment, but also the use of uh, skilled uh, professors and teachers uh, within doctoral schools. Um, we felt there was a need to have specific financial measures and reforms to the employment status of early stage researchers in the system. So this was something that was really uh, flagged as a big issue. Uh, a lot of those young researchers we talked to, and we had a chance to meet with quite a few of them during our, our missions to Yerevan, told us, well, look, uh, you know, we're actually doing side jobs in order to do our research because we don't we don't have a stipend, we don't have a, uh, a grant or, a, or any funding to be able to really continue. So. Uh, it's, it's really uncomfortable for us to be able to continue our research. Um, and then to try and put together again this idea of trying to over time help this cooperation between research teams in different uh, universities or research centers or institutes that are working on similar themes. Uh, and they may want to have a cooperation uh, on a more structured way. And this again is something which we looked at uh, examples from uh, the Baltic states and uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, as examples of how that's been done in other countries. So it's not, uh, we're not uh, starting from a white uh, sheet here. It's something that uh, there are lots of models that can be used to, to uh, draw it, um, yeah, experience from. Finally, the, the shift to performance-based funding. So again, when we looked at the funding system that's in place, and then again, Goran can say a few more words on that, no doubt. Uh, we, we saw again, well, underfunding, as we mentioned, um, that but the need to, to try and shift to something that actually incentivize higher performance within the system. And again, orientating funding to those uh, teams of researchers that are uh, performing the best based on uh, a, a good set of criteria that I mentioned earlier. 
So what we recommended was that the performance-based components of institutional funding, so if you've got 100, basically 20% of that would be based on your performance, it would be paid uh, on your performance, which would be evaluated after a three-year period. So again, in the report, we go into much more detail, but we pretty, I mean, made a number of recommendations about how that process could uh, be done. So I think that's almost my last slide. Uh, I hope I haven't taken too long, but again, the, the, the three sets of proposals were very interlinked. Uh, and it's, you know, we tried to put something together that we felt was a coherent whole, that if you implemented it from the government uh, over the next uh, years, or well, obviously things like COVID came along and, and disrupted that, but, uh, uh, you know, there's there's a, a roadmap there, if you like, for uh, moving the research, in, research system in Armenia to something that is uh, a bit more uh, higher performing. And again, can perform also within Armenia, but can also perform, for instance, within uh, cooperation programs like the Horizon Europe program, where Armenian uh, researchers can also draw on additional European funds. So, yeah, that's my last slide. So this was the, the team. So Luke Sota from Maastricht University, myself, Maria Nedeva from Manchester University, uh, and uh, Goran, and we had also two peers from uh, Latvia uh, and uh, Estonia, Indrek and Agrita, who uh, were working, Agrita is working at one of the major uh, Latvian universities in Indrek, was at uh, the Ministry of Education and Science uh, in Estonia. So they were able to bring uh, their expertise to uh, the team, and we very much appreciated that. So I, I will stop uh, sharing at this stage. Uh, and pass the floor. Thank you, Thank Alice. You. A very, very informative presentation. I just got introduced to it. Thank you very much for your efforts to work and help Armenia with this regard. Let me just ask, add my personal thanks. Uh, so thank you very much. So then I guess we could go through the question. Guran, if you have some comments, maybe we could listen to the comments and then... Uh... <clears throat> hey. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, sure. Uh, in 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 brief, at least. Um, uh, where should I start? I mean, of course, uh, the 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 whole the whole team was chaired by Luke Söte, as Alistair uh, showed there on his last slide. The practical work and the empirical work and the reporting was was really led by Alistair. So what he showed you is is a quite informative and I think comprehensive picture of the whole thing. My responsibility, <clears throat> as well as other team members' responsibilities, were then a little bit more selective. Maybe three things um, sort of um, stroke me when we did the work and visited Armenia, and this was back in 2019 then, so I appreciate, of course, that there has been development since, and we had the COVID period, which was difficult, and there has been other other um, difficulties too in Armenia since then, of course. Um, but maybe a couple of no, sort of sort of a couple of um, impressions, uh, which can hopefully inspire the the, the um, discussion here. Um, first, the relatively fragmented higher education and research system, with a large number of universities research institutes, private universities, public universities, smaller and larger. And uh, we made a strong point about that, I think, um, in the report, comparing, for example, with Estonia or uh, also Lithuania, I would say, maybe is a country which is almost of the exact similar size as Armenia, more or less, in terms of population, um, where, where then Armenia um, sort of um, comes out having a very high number of higher education institutions of various kinds, and and uh, which we then questioned uh, uh, whether this is efficient, whether it is uh, driving quality, quality in education, quality in research, uh, and. Possibly the new initiative here by by your government in Armenia is is a step towards finding a solution to that and consolidating the the resources and the forces a little bit. Um, uh, possibly we can come back back to that um, 
I think neither Alistair or myself are very well informed about the latest developments in, in that respect. A second point of reflection from my side would be the introduction of the performance-based funding system, as Alistair also pointed out there, where um, the whole motive for that is, of course, to, to find a funding system which promotes quality and promotes talent. Um, and this is a delicate matter. Uh, there are many examples uh, in, in several European countries, in America as well, other countries too, I, I assume, although I'm not so well informed about those. But um, it's, I mean, it's a matter of a combination of, of many various uh, indicators that can, can play a role and can contribute and build a performance-based funding system. In research, we speak about bibliometrics of various kinds, and, and they are also a manifold, a num number of various uh, indicators there. PhD graduates, research grants, external funding compared to uh, base funding from, from, from the, the local or domestic uh, sources. Um, it can be postdoctoral positions and possibly many other components too. And we only speak about research still. There are national systems which also takes uh, education into account and, and, um, and couple research funding with, with education. Um, so, so uh, just to just to make a reflection about that, this is a complicated matter. We uh, suggested, uh, as Alistair had on one of the slides, uh, level. Uh, the actual design of it is is nothing that we have dig deeper into, and and that can be discussed, and we can we can go deeper into that uh, how, how it should be designed and and set up, if so. Um, and then possibly my third uh, reflection would relate to uh, the link between research and teaching, which we found to be quite weak. And again, maybe the new governmental initiative with the academic city is a step towards um, finding a solution and, and improving this situation. Uh, because to us, it was um, quite... Um, striking how, how how separated the the university or the higher education was towards the the research uh, um, uh, there was a gap simply and this is not um, optimal of course uh, so so that will be um uh, sorry for taking time but that will be three three like important things that I noted during the work when we visited and the site visits that that we were undertaking. Allow me to allow me to end with a little bit of a maybe just a private reflection or an anecdote. Even I am I am of Swedish origin. I live in Stockholm for the most of of the time. I also, I'm right now in San Remo in Italy. And uh, if I look to the house, which is next to, to my house here, to the west, that's a house called Villa Nobel. And that's a quite magnificent villa that uh, Alfred Nobel owned. And he lived there um, towards the, the end of his life and he died there and he wrote his famous testament there which of course then um, established the Nobel Prizes. So there is a link between Stockholm and San Remo and just by watching this building I think it's a little bit of an inspiration and it's an inspiration also here tonight or in America this morning. Uh, what can be achieved uh, and what is in fact possible uh, to achieve. So um, just a little bit of a private note there. Thank you. 
And thank you, Goran. It's very fascinating to learn that you live next to such a villa right now. So obviously it's inspiring. So you mentioned the academic city and I know that both uh, Aram and Tigran had some uh, reservations regarding the decision that government has taken. And I want maybe to let Aram or Tigran to take over, present their views regarding that particular academic city. There are other new dimensions in Armenia since, two nine, since 2019 when you did this report. For example, we have now Armenian Society Fellows, we have decision of Ministry of Economy uh, providing subsidiary to the salaries the foreign graduates return back to the country. So there are lots of new things happening. But let's start from that academic city because I guess this was what Hakov uh, asked me to, to focus the discussion around during this Zoom. And just to give a heads up, in five minutes, it seems we may be disconnected and we'll need to reconnect again. So, Aram, do you want to start or Tigran takes over? What's your... Uh, I'll suggest Tigran rate? take over and then I'll follow. Okay, Tigran, then go. Um, okay, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I really appreciate the presentation. I think it uh, reinforced at least uh, for me that once again that um, uh, on the side of what's the uh, agenda of Kitouj, which is again, I want to stress that it's about research and development system and how through research and development we can make Armenia competitive and power it. So uh, other aspects like education and other stuff, they're obviously connected, but it's not part of our uh, core uh, agenda and mandate. So talking about that, I just want to say that I, whatever the, 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 the presentation you, you made right now, it's reinforced for me again, though I read the report fully myself and other members in our group also, uh, that mo what our agenda is, uh, is predominantly uh, aligned with what you are saying. Uh, and you can see if in our first even like uh, public statement that we did from which the GIDU started, we had three points there. First was about increasing the funding right at that moment, about 50%, because we knew there are already some projects on the table in ministry and they need to be funded, which government uh, a bit later, but uh, did that. But other two points were mostly disregarded, as well as the same way as mostly this report. In our, we are conv convinced that is mostly disregarded by the government. I, I'll, I'll explain why. So uh, the second point that we stated was that uh, right now we need a commitment about increased funding, uh, and we stated that at least one percent of GDP. Like I remember in your report, you are not stating any clear number, but you are bringing an example of countries where it is 0.05% or 0.9%, right? So it was more or less aligned what we were saying that it's not does not need to be right now. It needs to be in a few years. We are stating three years, but we need a commitment right now so that there is an energy uh, uh, among the, you know, all the community and all the stakeholders to work towards like how we are going to get to this uh, expenditures like uh, using it efficiently and the third point was uh, that we need a vision we need a analysis and we need a strategy and we should start working on it right now so I whatever I heard and also read in the report it's exactly obviously in the report you go in more details but these are the key points that uh, the government should start with and this isn't didn't happen right now um, uh, the, the funding was increased about 60% in absolute numbers, but because also our economy grew, economy grew, like when we checked the numbers for last year, the factual numbers, it's actually at 0.3% of GDP. It was 0.25 in 2020, I think. So it didn't really increase much. And also right now, there is no strategy. There is not, there is no, no even, <clears throat> we don't see any discussion or any programming government which is based on an understanding that R&D is a tool for national competitiveness. There is, there is nobody sees R&D or investment in R&D uh, from this perspective. Like you outline in your report that uh, there needs to be a vision about the role of science for the country and from the economy perspective, from social perspective, from even defense, it's outlined in probably two or three times in the report and and, um, and I've seen also in your email recently. 
So this is obviously like a critical issue, all these areas. And there is no understanding that R&D is important for this. And there needs to be specific targeted programs like national programs or infrastructure development, which you also talk about in a report to uh, increase the capabilities uh, of infrastructure and human capital. And unfortunately, the academic city is presented as a as, a, uh, as, the, as the most comprehensive strategy regarding science, which is not, which is not that, because it is a project about higher education. And according to that project, science is just needed for higher education, which is also incorrect. Uh, and even recently, a few days ago, there was a statement by the ministry, which uh, said that it's starting from 2027, the public funding will be allocated only to the consolidated universe. So yeah, just coming to my point again, that uh, just a few days ago, we saw a statement <clears throat> after another meeting in the government where the ministry clearly wrote that public funding starting from 2027 will be allocated only to the consolidated universities and public institutes that are merged into them. So from that statement, they are clearly outlining that there can't be any public research institution outside, outside of university system, <clears throat> which is total in our, in our, uh, <clears throat> in our opinion, is a total disregard of international experience where you have both, you have universities and with the research, you have public research institutions outside, uh, which are autonomous under the ministry or within the National Academy of Sciences. And you also have some connections between universities and public research institutions who are outside of university system, so, which is also outlined in, in many details in your report that this is one of the solutions that can be uh, used to uh, uh, connect the cooperation between education and science. So uh, my point here is mainly that uh, the academic city is being presented as a, as a answer to this question of lack of um, lack of uh, usage of R&D and science as a tool for national competitiveness, but it is not. And it is contradicting fully uh, to the other countries' ex experience and also to the report that, that you made. Unfortunately, it is being, uh, again, most of the points I already presented, right, they are disregarded. And the consolidation point, which was in the recommendations, is uh, distorted, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, and, and I can also mention what is distorted, why it is distorted, but also there was one issue which I would like to ask because I have a chance to speak at the call, to the co-authors that, that we noticed in the report. So how is it distorted? In the, in the recommendations part, uh, it's talking about uh, consolidation of the universities. Again, it is outside of the scope of, of Kitush, so uh, let's put that aside. Um, but it's also talking about transforming academy into a learned society, which is by the, even by the current mandate of academy, it should be. Obviously, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat. I mean, in your report, we were very diplomatic about Academy of Sciences. We are very frank in this. It is uh, in not a good shape. And I would even go further and say that many people there are corrupt. So it needs to be changed. And we, we were very uh, clear about this in, even in our public statements. Uh, but our main point here is that we have seen throughout this like three years, starting from the, when the report was released and, and we basically formed this initiative, we didn't see any move by the government to try even to reform the, the academy. In contrast, we have seen that after the recent change in the, in the, in the government uh, governance of the uh, National Academy of Sciences, they started putting forward some really interesting recommendations of how they want to be reformed. And they sent it these this, uh, suggestions. And, and we, we were been following how the discussions are going between the academy and the government, and also we sometimes facilitated these discussions. Unfortunately, we have seen until now total disregard towards these recommendations of how we can reform and start basically cleaning up our Academy of Science and making it really honorable society of scientists. Uh, and um, so I'm just stressing here that this function is in the uh, 
statutes of the academy and of, obviously it needs to be enforced. But it was taken from the, and, and also it talks about that the institutions should, uh, should be reorganized, merged between together, which is, by the way, one of the recommendations of the academy was how to merge the institutions between its system, which we have like around, I think, 30 institutions. They wanted to consolidate them into smaller number of institutions. And they were even suggesting to discuss like which parts should go to universities and which parts should remain within the academy. Uh, again, we have seen total disregard for these suggestions. But uh, even in, in your recommendations, you are talking about having, uh, you recommend that institutions should go outside of the academy, uh, but you talk even of a possibility of having independent institutions, which all the countries that you mentioned in your report, like there were like seven, no, nine countries, two of them like Georgia and uh, Moldova were like as a negative examples, but there were other seven countries in the report mentioned that all of them have this kind of institutions. Uh, some of them even have Academy of Sciences, three of them have Academy of Sciences and inside Academy of Research Institutions. But obviously institutions outside of university system, they exist and they have a very critical role. So the, the distortion I'm talking about is that our government right now pushes the agenda that institutions can be only within university system. And this is, um, yeah, it's just like the distortion I'm talking about. My, my question that I wanted to ask the co-authors co was this. So we, we noticed that in the, in the report, again, I, I wanna stress again that it's very comprehensive and, and very well written about the real issues in Armenia. There was one disconnect though. So we noticed that there are like three scenarios that the report outlined as, a, as a, for the future, how the system can change. One is basically keeping the system as is and trying to find some small hacks and increase the efficiency. Uh, second was choosing the option of uh, Estonia basically, where they took out all the institutes, merged some of them into universities, but kept some of them separate. Again, I want to stress, even, even Estonia kept some of the institutes separate. Even Estonia still right now has one center within its academy, which is saying that it's not like they didn't totally dismantle the system. So the third system was something like, like French system or, or German system uh, where you have this uh, some network which might be outside of National Academy of Sciences but there is still uh, institutes outside of the universities and they have formed some kind of network. So all the three uh, scenarios are, are very interesting. Obviously they, they, they outline most of the uh, systems that exist uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, the disconnect was when there was a specific recommendation to take all the institutes out. So specifically choose the, the second option there was no substantial argument given why we should choose those, uh, this option, though it was out outlined many times in the report that whatever scenario Armenia chooses, it should be based on the vision of the role of the science for the national needs. It was stressed many times, which again, I'm saying uh, that it's uh, completely disregarded from government programs. Uh, but uh, considering that there was like a jump to a, to a recommendation, the specific recommendation, which was unclear for us. So I, I, I just wanted to use the chance and ask the co-authors why, why was this specific recommendation made, the specific scenario chosen. Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can address that point quickly, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't think we intended to choose a scenario. So the three scenarios were, um, so it may just be the wording in the report, but these, these are three scenarios basically. And it's, you can probably invent a fourth with different other models as well. But, um, and we, we felt, you know, each of those scenarios has to be looked at and, and, and thought about and the pros and cons we up. So, I mean, my personal view is that, uh, and I think, you know, I stressed this in the presentation, I think we stressed it in the report, and even the Estonian case you mentioned, where the merger of the National Academy of Science Institutes took place, it took place over a decade. Huh? So it's not something you do. And if you do do it too rapidly, then basically you risk destroying 
the research teams that are there within different institutes. So without judging the National Academy uh, as a whole, we, as I say, we saw that the, there are research institutes within the Academy that are pretty good performing and I mean, on, on different uh, criteria. So our, our main concern was to try and get that cooperation going in the system. And um, there, again, there are different models and we, we put forward recommendations on, on that. And what we wanted to do initially was to get reduce the disconnect between the National Academy Research Institutes and to some extent some of the other public research institutes under ministries and the higher education system, which needs to be more have a higher research component within it and better research strategies. And we felt that this is not something you can do overnight uh, by either consolidating universities with research institutes or bringing universities together by, uh, together themselves or whatever. It's something that needs you need to have a strategy behind it. First of all, both at the level of the country and then at the level of the organizations that are potentially merging or at least trying to align their activities, you know, to get those economies of uh, scale, uh, sharing of equipment, uh, equipment expenses. We heard people telling us, you know, we've got equipment, but we don't have the, the consumer rules. The consumer rules are really difficult to get, you know, through, through export licenses. So if that's the case, and it's, you know, you've got to, You've got to face these things, at least consolidate expertise around doing that and give people access to the equipment. So our, our recommendations were more, you, you need to start moving, it needs to be done. Do, you need to take some hard decisions, you being probably the government, but hopefully the stakeholders about consolidation of universities. But that's that wasn't totally in our remit. We just said, look, it's, it's not sustainable, basically. And it's not, a, if you want to research-based universities, which are important in any system you need to have you need to do some consolidation but our main message was there, there is a relatively good performing in some areas research teams and and they could be consolidated together in different ways so another example i'm working on right now in greece um, the greek system is a set of public universities uh, plus i think it's uh, 10 or 12 Public research uh, centres, institutes under uh, under the General Secretary of Research and Innovation. So right now, what the last period, 2014-2020, and now 21-27 periods, European funding periods, uh, the Greeks are have done two things. They they put together a program which says, okay, if you want to get access to funding for nice shiny new pieces of equipment, you have to work together. So, you know, you're not going to get it unless you bring together, the, everyone working on agri-food uh, has to come together and make a sort of networked organization that will work together in order to make sure that any money that's invested by the government is invested in an optimal way for the research system. And again, for more than that, it's also for uh, supporting economy, society, environment in Greece as well. So I think that's, that's something which they've, they've been trying to do in Greece with a mix of public and uh, in research centers, which are funded in one way, and higher education institutes, which are funded uh, in another way. Uh, so it is possible, and I don't think full merger is, is, is always necessary. I think it's more about uh, combining people, combining uh, access to equipment, combining uh, knowledge that's more important, uh, and making sure that people are being funded based on their performance and not on based on, you know, more, uh, more, yeah less subjective <laughs> uh, choices. So yeah, so I, I, I didn't feel we had in the report, but if that's how you read it, I had made a, a specific recommendation for one of the scenarios, but uh, I think we thought all three had their pros and cons, but needed to be done in a very careful and considered way within the framework of that national vision of what sciences and research and development is supposed to contribute to national development. Uh, yeah, so just a, just a small. Yeah, now if I can just a small comment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll say thanks. I mean, I totally agree with what you are saying. Uh, and uh, again, like there are many ways how you can, and we have seen this. Like, and then even in the recommendations, there's a lot of many examples about. Okay, if you need to increase the cooperation, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the, the, that that there is a ways how to increase the cooperation, like. Uh, these competence centers, like excellence centers, right, and then. 
uh, having dual status for the for the scientists of being in institutes and also in, in universities. There are uh, obviously solutions, and we have seen many countries. You also uh, bringing in examples that can be done. Yeah, just uh, the, the disconnect again. I just want to stress again. I don't know why it happened. Maybe you also. It, it's been already three years. You forgot why it happened. The disconnect for us was that was a specific scenario chosen without bringing the uh, the supporting arguments. But again, let's I, I can we can go ahead. Uh, Salam, go ahead. Should I should I continue? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I want to add another dimension to what Tigran said uh, about the action of the government and the recent decisions. And the problem is that. Uh, when we talked, and Gitush has talked to different groups uh, involved in science, which are the heads of the, um, the institutions, the scientific research institutions, uh, the young generation of um, researchers, and the established researchers. We've also talked to the heads of many universities, the uh, directors of universities, uh, to see their views. Uh, we have received very many different uh, uh, options and, and considerations um, about those. But the main thing that everybody shared is that they are all ignored. Nobody's caring about what they want and what they uh, consider, etc. All of these decisions were enforced. The government is going not through inclusive process, but through coercion. So you'll do this or you are gone. You, you go into university or you're fired. You'll not get any finances, et cetera, et cetera. In the world, it's scientific communities that organize the way science works. You can't be a bureaucrat and organize efficient scientific communities. That doesn't work like that. You can't be a bureaucrat and create the best opera theater. You can't be a bureaucrat and create the best arts university. You should be in, from inside. You should know how science works to be efficient science organizer. The problem is that all of these decisions are done by policymakers who don't care about science people. None of the people from academy has even been considered as a party to discuss all of these decisions before they were publicly announced. All of the scientists in this country have learned about their nearest future, which is talking about three years from now, from the TV report of the uh, meeting at the, uh, at the government where they announced their plans. Nobody was informed about it. Nobody was, was asked about their opinion. It is all enforced. And as, as a report outlined, you can't really coerce scientists to, into doing something. You have to carefully work with them to help them understand the importance of cooperation, of joining effort, of kind of working together, sharing uh, uh, the laboratories, facilities, bringing in students. You have to convince them and create incentives. These are two ways, pushing and pulling. But both have to work together and you have to give them time to adopt, understand, and act because they have things to finish. They have commitments that started today and science is done. That very many scientific efforts are not accomplished in a year or two. If you set a hard stop at 2027, for many, that means end of life because many of their plans in scientific research went beyond that. Clearly, they have commitments for that. They have international corporations go beyond just a few years from now. And this is all ignored. Nobody cares. We do this and that's final. And that's not the way you work with scientific community. And our problem that we see as Gitush is that these people don't really understand what's going on. Because, well, the most efficient scientists may find their jobs elsewhere in the world. They are highly asked everywhere. They, they are already in international corporations. And for them, moving to other university, into other country is a, a, a simple matter of, uh, of an agreement to go there because they are, they, they are required in many other places. Not very efficient scientists may be dependent on local grants and they may stay, 
but you kind of diminish the quality of your science immediately as you make it less attractive for your own scientists by ignoring their point of view, because science is an area where uh, you have to provide a good balance between goals and, and some kind of guidance and freedom. You can't just tell people what to do. Science doesn't work like that. It, it requires natural curiosity. It requires interest and involvement that has to be supported and guided. And that's the first problem that we have on hand. But the second problem is that, I mean, it's a joke to explain to people that we are solving all of the problems of higher education and science by creating a physical facility somewhere outside of Europe. And if you look at the original concept of the academic city, and it was just published, like 90% of text is about buildings. It's about territories. There is no word about how this is going to work. Nobody cares. And that's, that's the problem that we, we see, um, that this is total ignorance. People actually read a very um, significant report that you've made and made very primitive, ignorant conclusions. Well, and, and when we talk about the, all of these things to very many people, most of we, that we get as an answer is that everything is unclear. We don't know how is this, this is going to happen in many of the areas that are important, that are significant, but instead we know very clearly that the funding will go to build buildings facilities for laboratories. Uh, and I see a very clear disconnect between these two. There is, there is this definite uh, action towards making something visible, something politically important, something that everybody can say, well, this is a building. Everybody says, this is a building. So we've built a building for science and, and or actually not for science. The, the major announcement that has been made during this uh, government um, session that uh, where they introduced the concept is that our universities are in trouble so what we're gonna do we're gonna save our universities by uh, coercing scientific institutions to join universities so that we get the best universities in the world because when they get more science publications they got ranked higher and i, I should say when we met one of the I, i'm not announcing the name because we've agreed that we're not uh, be uh, publicly telling what people told to us, but one of the rectors of universities, uh, an important university, he said, oh yeah, I'm quite interested in getting some scientific institutions inside because that will increase my ranking. But outside of that, no interest, no interest in science ranking. So it's all very unfortunate. Our universities are not interested in science and that is clearly stated in the report. Otherwise they would do some science already. Uh, and we are now connecting to universities that culturally are not there with the perception, the right perception and value, value of science as an important practice and activity and a goal. And we are they're putting, pushing the acting and, and sometimes very efficiently working institutions. I, I, I say very in the context of financing and support they get into these institutions that have no culture of science. What will happen to them? And this is going to be done in three years from now, at most. So it means tomorrow. We are starting tomorrow doing that, pushing this to a, a very polar and until now inefficiently cooperating uh, structures into one very artificially without having enough strategy in place, without making enough effort to kind of create a sustainable structure and without making sure that this joint structure will be efficient without seeing without solving problems why by one it's just physically let's push them to into one and see what happens well i believe in most of the cases we'll we'll see destruction and nothing will happen and there'll be no significant outcome from that effort and that worries us a lot and that's basically uh, why we are um, very much against the way, 
I'm not saying we're against the scientific city. That might be a very good solution to many of the problems, but as a, as a singular one for all solution that is ignorant of many of the actual real issues is, is, is that's a very dangerous proposal on the table. That's what I we, we want to emphasize. Uh, so the question comes down whether Alizer and Goran have the power to influence the government decisions in Armenia, right? <laughs> I guess you and Tigran just uh, managed to bring, to reduce the problem to empowering our guests uh, to influence the government decisions, which I'm afraid will not be in their hands. And uh, instead, we could maybe kind of solicit questions from the chat or unless Alizer and Goran have some comments to your um, discussion. Uh, let me know, just. Yeah, I think there's some interesting comments uh, in the chat, uh, which uh, I, I would say I agree with uh, the points being made by, by Arsene and, uh, and it's Ruben. Um, so I, th I, I think um, the, there's always a, you know it's in some ways it's easy for for governments and I'm not uh, picking on the, the Armenian government here or the people in the ministries uh, for that but it's easier to say we'll we'll build the building uh, and that and we'll put everyone in the building and that that will that will solve uh, the issue of uh, fragmented uh, research it, you know the, the the practice shows that doesn't work and indeed there might be very good reasons for keeping some uh, smaller research institutes, which are very specialized, separate. But the key issue is cooperation in the system, um, and I think that's what that's what should be stimulated and enhanced and incentivized by uh, the funding system. So I think uh, Arsen mentions the, the challenges of the way that the science committee um, funds, and, and you know we had these discussions with him. We said you've got to change your funding model. You've got to increase the incentive within the funding model for cooperation in the system and avoid people you know sitting in the laboratory or, or the university or whatever and, and not cooperating with other people in the system who might have very complementary knowledge and uh, skills and equipment uh, that they can actually work with so that's what i would you know that would be my core message you know the building might solve things in the long run but it will certainly not solve things in terms of you know giving people the, the facilities they, they require but it, you know, the first step is to get people working together and that comes through the funding system and how you incentivize people to, to cooperate and the sorts of proposals they have to submit and the criteria they have to meet. Uh, in my opinion, if I could just um, chime in, I think the major problem of Armenia is a lack of critical mass who can perform cutting edge research, be competitive and attract others to their research ideas and have their group of followers in science. And what I think Armenia should do, should focus on maybe institutionalizing a process that could help us to put out endowment packages to attract um, young fresh graduates from top universities to move to Armenia, work and create here. And that would change the local climate. As an example, I'll just bring up my example, my personal example, last year I was on sabbatical in Armenia for a whole year with the Fulbright Fellowship. And thanks to, for example, CSIE, which is a newly formed Center of Scientific Innovation and Education, we were able to form a small group of uh, students in Polytechnic Aerial Robotics Lab, where I was able to reproduce some of the experiments from my lab at Illinois. And when I couldn't find the right community inside Armenia to come and applaud what I did, roughly saying, when you get a success, you want people to applaud, I reached out to young graduates, uh, close to graduations, graduate students in my field based on the conference publications and so on, people whom I knew. And I showed them what I was able to do in Armenia. And the kids were very much impressed. And then I started talking to them about moving to Armenia. We have lined up four or five people who are slowly coming. First one is coming in September, then December, next June, and next December. So we're lining up people who would come and, for example, build a center of excellence in autonomy or robotics or something. But then what I want to see happening that the government joins their forces to institutionalize the process. Because when you rely too much on the private funding, 
And there are people who are ready to put the funding, no question. It just can't be long lasting and sustainable. There has to be taxpayers money uh, playing the game, dancing together, right? It takes two to tango, like they say. So, I mean, there are some positive changes happening in Armenia that I just wanted to share a glimpse of my personal life experience in case it would keep everyone more inspired and more in a positive mood rather than in just listing all the shortcomings what the government failed to do or doesn't see as an opportunity or doesn't take the right decision. And most likely the initiatives um, of Armenian Society Fellows, I know they recently had their second conference, I meet both conferences, is also laying ground for some centers of excellence that people could come and join. And there are private foundations like Ruben Lucinians is here who has launched his Pieris Fund last year, helping to develop more labs in uh, Alihanyan Institute. And there are many other initiatives as well, including ARPA, including maybe FAST and so on. So with this positive mood, I wonder if there are more questions in chat that we could answer and discuss. And if there are more uh, questions that you would like to respond to, please let me know. Let's give a chance to Goran, maybe he has some comments as well. We have only eight minutes left to this next Zoom session and it would be good indeed to wrap up, right? Because yeah, we have I been so long well, if anything, yeah. I mean, Armenia is a relatively small country after all, and even in, in my home country, which is which has a population of about 10 million people, I mean, we have the same discussion that we cannot do everything. We cannot be in world leading class in all subjects. So I guess that's, that's even more relevant to, to Armenia. But when we visited you, we met a number of very dedicated people. We visited a number of very uh, motivated environments full of people with spirit and will and uh, enthusiasm and talent. So um, altogether, I mean, it's just, it's not just, but but yes, it is about finding a way of supporting that spirit among individuals and uh, individuals build environments. Um, so um, whether whether new buildings are needed or not, I'm not sure that that new buildings are needed, but 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 links between environments, research groups, institutions, and individuals, are probably needed and incentives to cooperate, um, both nationally as well as internationally. Um, yeah, that's that's what comes to mind for me. Uh, so Ruben is asking if uh, you could kind of promote it through EU to create a roadmap for Armenia to take it to the next level. How long can you commit to collaborate with Armenia, with a group of people like us, right, who are interested, reading your reports in full, full details, engaging in such discussions. Is there an opportunity to build up a roadmap for Armenia? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're only two people, so we're, and, uh, and we can only do so much, but I think the, you know, I, I mentioned that, there's, there's a number of, of, of uh, pieces of work going on. Uh, there's always projects being supported. And I think um, the policy support facility that uh, we worked through in 2019 for the report that was published in 2020 has been renewed. So, uh, you know, the Armenian ministry could make a request for additional support through that uh, that instrument as well. So, you know, if there's, if there's a need for it, we, I think it can be mobilized. and. Uh, um, so that's that's one option, of course, and I think uh, it, it's convincing people in the country as well that they, they, there needs to be a clearer strategy. And I think that it, it's really a it's a win win if you if you get people around the table and you get a clear discussion, and it's not just one or two people in a ministry making choices, then it's much easier to get things to move afterwards. Uh, so you know it's much harder if it's coming from top down and 
and then people don't uh, don't really appreciate how that's been designed and maybe don't understand what's being proposed. So I think that's also something that's sort of co-design of, of policies. That's also standard practice now, and it should not be uh, only bureaucrats or people like myself in Europe who are, who are designing strategies. It should be the, the people who are going to be impacted uh, in, in the system and they need to be consulted and, and involved in the discussions to make sure it works. So, yeah. And then somebody I mean, yeah. is asking if it could be privately funded, and I guess all kinds of funding is welcome. Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean uh, that was also impressive in Armenia was the diaspora, uh, and, and, and indeed not just diaspora people in Armenia with with uh, private institutions. We met a number of different foundations. Uh, there was the educational one, which the name is going out of my head, but which was extraordinarily impressive. Um, as a tumor, yeah. So, you know, inspiring young kids to 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 take up maths and STEM type of education. So, I mean, some of the things that we saw were like, you know, really impressive. So, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, support for for Armenia from outside, uh, from the diaspora, but beyond. Uh, the European Union has a commitment to 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 support Armenia, and I think needs to show that in as active ways as possible in these difficult times. So yeah, and of course, if we can mobilize private uh, support, that's also great. Yeah. So there's uh, a question in the chat. Uh, sorry, okay, go I, ahead. I wanted to just chime in and say that um, in, in uh, what Naira said before about her personal willingness to support uh, the scientific community, development scientific community in Armenia by bringing in new talent and also what uh, just uh, was proposed of the of private fund funding issue and the diaspora. Well, actually, there is the whole organization which is called uh, ASOLF, who uh, that unites the Armenian scientists from around the world that is trying to do exactly that. But, well, the only problem is that this whole community is again ignored. I mean, they've, they've organized a very important event here in, in Dilijan, and none of the government people attended it. They, well, they were all being invited. And some of the brightest scientists, Armenian scientists around the world arrived there and, and uh, nobody was there from the government, almost nobody. And that's one of the issues that I've just talked about, uh, that um, th there is this significant resource that can be used to to get a jointly built uh, an efficient structure where like Gitush is is the activity, it's the social movement, but also it unites the potential customers of science, people that are interested in science and are ready to pay for science to be to turn into practical business opportunities. And these people are also ignored. So it's it's very interesting how the government is going to play this game by ignoring all the parties that are critical for the success. And I, I, I'm just wondering how long this is going to happen. I guess the government yeah. has too many challenges and we keep challenging them more. Okay, so we, we just have one and a half minute left. Maybe we should think about wrapping up, right? Yes, Who has I, the think, last word? I think we should, we should try to wrap up. If there's any additional comments, just a very short comment probably. Anybody? Okay, well, thank you very much, panelists. And also thank you, uh, Naira, for an excellent moderation. Sorry for the problems we had, but we are, we are going to have another panel discussion next month, August 20th on Artsakh. And uh, three experts are going to discuss what can happen and what should happen. And the panelists are uh, Nerses Kopalyan, Anna Ohanyan, and Sosi Tatikian. So we will send you the emails and you're welcome to join. Thanks again. And Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Nice meeting you. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks Thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Bye. indeed. Bye.